Pla Tell you, I've got to give up smoking. I couldn't keep up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I was worried. I was worried what he was going to do. But like, oh, where are we going with this? But I tell you, hey, you did well, folks. I tell you, keeping up with that. Praise the Lord. <sighs> Hallelujah. All right, let's go to Acts 17. I'm lost for words. <laughs> I'm really lost for words. Did you like that, brother Kurt? Did you? Yeah. Was it you that went to Yeeha or what? Huh? Oh, it was you, is it? Oh, it's, ah, yes. All right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I tell you. All right, <laughs> I've got to pray. Lord, I pray and ask them right now that you would help us as we uh, open the Word of God. And uh, what a song, just over in the glory land. And of course, we're all anticipating, we're all excited about being there one day, seeing you face to face. And truly, it's going to be a real blessing. And I really don't think words could express, uh, Father, how we feel about seeing you face to face one day. But Lord, we're certainly looking forward to that. And Lord, the joy in which we sing this morning was just amazing. And I, I believe, Lord, uh, I don't think I'm speaking out of term when I say this. I believe that you are pleased with the singing, the worship that was here today. And we do magnify you and want to lift you up. Uh, but Lord, as we've sung unto you, under you, I just do pray now that our hearts would be settled, that we would hear you. This is your time now as far as what you want to say to us. Lord, I'm, the, I'm, the, uh, I'm the, the fleshly agent, I'm the physical agent, and I just pray that nothing will get in the way, and I ask that you just use me this morning just to be a, a conduit, just to be a blessing, just to be an encouragement. 
And so I pray that you'd fill each and every one of us with your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, there's many battles <clears throat> that churches face today. Would you agree with that? Many battles that believers face. But you know, the more that you read your Bible and you, you look at church history, you'll find that what we face today is really no different to what the first century church would have faced. I read a book not long ago, and I've read it a number of times. It's probably one of my favourite books, apart from the Bible. It was a book called uh, "Being a 21st Century Church in the F No Being a First Century Church in the 21st Century." Clarence Sexton's book, yeah, good book. Uh, we need to face what we face today with the same wisdom, uh, the same power, the same attitude that the early church, the apostles, the early church fathers and all of that that we talk about the same way that they faced it. Amen. What we find here in Acts chapter 17 and what Paul experienced at Athens really is no different to what we face today. If I was to retitle it, I would probably retitle this message Authentic Christianity in an Athenian world. Authentic Christianity in an Athenian world. He says in verse number 23, and we're going to look at some scripture, I know that, but I just want to share this. He says, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. The unknown God. Of course, Paul tells them, hey, you're being very superstitious about this. But that term unknown God is this. It's uh, agnostos theos. Agnostos theos. Aren't you glad I drank my coffee this morning? What English word do you suppose we get from the Greek word agnostos? Agnostic. Agnosticism. And then also there's Gnosticism. So what Paul faces here with this inscription really is no different to what we face today when we go out. And if you're somebody who is keen on sharing your faith, and I hope you are, you'll find and come across the path of many who would class themselves as agnostics or Gnostics, Gnosticism. Agnostos Theos. Agnostic, a person who believes that nothing is known or can be known of the existence of or nature of God. You can't know him. Gnosticism deals with the knowledge, but of a myth mythical knowledge, but believes that God is unknowable. So it's very mystical. Gnosticism is very mystical. Agnosticism says, well, you can't really know the existence of God and so on. Isn't that a sad situation to be in? You can't know God. The thing about this phrase or this inscription to the unknown God, what, what it leaves open is, is this. Because you can't know God, God can be whoever you want him to be. Or God can be whoever she wants to be. You know what I mean? Because we've got people now that say God is a she and so on and so forth. So that's probably one of the sad things. And, if, and, and the thing about Athens is that Athens, it was said of Athens that there's more gods in Athens than what there is men. Uh, it was a place where idolatry ruled. It was a place where agnosticism was, Gnosticism was. All of the, all of the trappings that Paul faced in his time, we face today. No different. The only difference that I would say would be we probably don't uh, address it like we should. I don't think we're as bold as what the first century church was. Would you agree with that? I mean, you read the book of Acts. I mean, wherever Paul went, as his manner was, he would go into the synagogues and not howdy and not all this sort of stuff and, hey, great to see you. Man, I haven't seen you for so... He got up and he would just preach Christ under them regardless of how they felt or what they thought or whatever. To the point, as I shared during the week, that he was taken out of a, out of a city and stoned and left for dead. 
I don't think we have the boldness that the early church had, generally speaking. So this makes way for accepting any God or gods. And I would say that Australia has many, many. So this term, the unknown God, isn't just saying that God cannot be known, but the meaning itself opens for polytheism many gods. I keep referring back to this time and time again, but it, it's never left me. Remember when Oprah Winfrey got up and said, oh, there's many paths to what we know as God. Well, there's not many paths, there's only one path. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you get all these celebrity pastors that she asked the question to, like the Carl Lentzes and the T.D. Jakes and all these well-known preachers. And, and, and she would ask them that and they would skirt around, Joel Osteen, skirt around the issue. Hey, there's nothing to skirt around. If someone said to you, oh, there's many paths, you know what we say? No, I'm sorry, there's only one path and that's Jesus. Regardless of whether you're liked by family members or not, Jesus is the only way. As I said, it was said of Athens that there are more gods than men. So today, both agnosticism and Gnosticism flow freely. And the, the area that they flow really freely through would be secret societies. You know, our world is filled with secret societies. Uh, Freemasonry. Skull and Bones, Knights Templar, Illuminati, all those things that if you're someone who likes to keep up to date and up to speed with those things, all of those secret societies all have agnosticism or Gnosticism deeply rooted in their religions. Because Freemasonry basically says God can be whoever you want to be. Creator God, this God, Hindu God, whatever. As a matter of fact, I, I've shared this during the week, and, and I tell you, soul winning will give you plenty of preaching illustrations, I tell you. Wednesday, Duncan and I went out, and we were in Clontarf, and the first door we went to, we, we went in the gate, the gate just walked in there, and I like to look around, as I because you learn a lot by looking, and as, I'm, as I've gone in there, and there's statues, there's Hindu statues, and all this sort of stuff, very, you know, like, wow, it's just full on. All over. And I knocked on the door and a lady answered the door and we went through our spiel and we're letting, letting her know who we are and noticed that there was a little rainbow flag on the door and all this sort of stuff and like, oh, this is interesting. And she said, oh, I'm Roman Catholic. <laughs> and both, <laughs> both of us are like, I reckon it was at the same time, we sort of leaned back and looked out in the yard and saw all these Hindu or all these statues and all that sort of stuff and I said, Roman Catholic? Yeah. She says, as a matter of fact, you caught me on a good day. If I was bad, I would have told you where to go. And I'm like, oh, okay. So we're trying, to, we're trying to tell her about Jesus. But basically, Jesus to her was a good guru. That's what she said. Do you know? she's, he's just a guru. And the thing is, is that, that this spiritism, so this, this spirituality, this, this Gnosticism, agnosticism, whatever, it's rife. The, and us, we, I think we said to her, do, do you know for sure that if you died, you're going to go to heaven? Because most Catholics don't. They say, oh, well, I hope so. It's like, well, hang on a sec. So you go into, you go into most unsaved houses, and I don't know whether it's just something that people do or they just love to decorate their garden, but you see these statues everywhere. And it's, it's, it's no wonder that we struggle, but no different from the first century church, but it's no wonder we struggle to try and get the gospel across when people are so confused and corrupted by false religion. Roman Catholicism is false religion. Correct. It's not right. The system, I'm not saying, them, hey, are there saved people in the Roman Catholic Church? It's a possibility. I'm not saying that there's not. But the system itself is sending millions to hell. Yeah. Millions. Because they still believe that Mary is the mediator between God and man when the Bible says that Jesus is. But more than that, more than that, in Australia, people will often say to you when you talk to them about, oh, it's okay, I have my own religion. Yeah. Have you heard that before? I have my own religion. I have my own beliefs. In other words, what they're saying is, is, hey, don't bother me, but I've got my own religion. And the thing is this, is that their religion allows them to do whatever they want to do. That's, that's Athenian. That's, that's Greek. That's Greco-Roman. That's Romanism. 
Just do whatever you want to do. Mate, my God lets me smoke. My God lets me drink. My God lets me fornicate. My God lets me do whatever I want to do. Hey, don't bother me. I've got my own religion. Paul faced that in his day and we face it in our day as well. I have my own beliefs. Well, if your belief isn't in Jesus Christ, then you're on your way to hell. That's the very truth of it. That's the very truth of it. But also, they have their own gods. Australians have their own gods. I have my own religion. There's movie stars that gods are made out of. There's rock stars that gods are made out of. Sports stars that gods are made out of. Now, I was messing around. Cameron was in the city during the week, and I said, oh, you're going to church at Suncorp. Suncorp Stadium is a, listen, rugby league's a religion. I mean, they've got the statue of Wally Lewis there, right? Did you know that during the, uh, the gladiator days when they would come into Rome and they'd have all the, the gladiators and the statues there, they would pay homage at the statues and they would, they would touch their toes or they'd bow down to them and all this sort of stuff. Listen, hey, it's no different. Sport is a religion. Got my own religion. Yeah, it's called sport. Governments can be a religion. You can worship governments. You can worship nations. Wokeism is a religion. The LGBTQI is a religion. Come on, is that right? It's a religion. People worship that. And if you, if you touch the sacred cow of wokeism or the alphabet mafia or alphabet soup, however you want to call it, if you touch, if you touch them, woe be unto you. Woe be unto you if you bring Jesus into it. Woe be unto you if you say, hang on a second, I can still have a, have a, a, a same-sex relationship and believe in Jesus Christ. I, I would highly doubt that. Because if you're truly born again, the Spirit of God will work in a person to do away with that stuff. Do away with it. As a matter of fact, hold your place here in Acts, and I am going somewhere. I'm just not raving this morning. Go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I think it's, I'll be honest with you, I think it's despicable that we give a month's worship to, to the LGBTQI community when there are men and women who have given their life for this country and they get one day. They get one day. That's sad. That's, that's, that's not sad. That's, 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 that's despicable. That's evil. Yeah. That's wrong. I mean, I, I would rather recognize someone who'd given their life in military or whatever it is in, instead of uh, worshipping the, these things. These things. Listen to what the Bible says. And here's the problem. Paul spoke up about it. I mean, he's in, he's in the, very, the very hot spot. He's in the very place. He's in Athens. He goes to Areopagus, and I'll share more about that in a moment, where one of their most famous prophets said something. And yet Paul went there, and he preached against that, and he shared them who God really is. What do we do today when we come across this sort of stuff? What do we do? Look at verse number 20. For the invisible things... Of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Let me just say this. Nobody will, not, nobody will go to hell not knowing. Nobody will go. People know because of creation. Now, they, they might want to be, oh, no, evolution, evolution. No, 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 hang on. It's, uh, that's an excuse. That's an excuse. The very fact that there are things that are seen and un understood and eternal powers and Godhead, and all, they are without excuse. No one is going to stand before Jesus on the great white throne judgment day and say, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. Isn't that the world today? The world thinks they're so wise. And yet in all their wisdom, they're stupid. They became fools. Now, notice something about the world today in which we live. They like to change things. By the way, that is an Antichrist spirit. When you go back to the book of uh, Daniel, he changes times. Okay, Verse 23, And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, 
So there's your, the statues and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. There's the worship of creation itself, animals. Listen, I, I think I've said this before, forgive me, but you get more jail time for killing a snake than what you do a person. Or a bat. Or a koala. You know, bomba. I don't care, whatever it is. You get more jail time for killing an animal. So what the world has done is they've put the, 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 the value of an animal higher than a human being. I mean, the world slaughters babies still. Verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own heart to dishonour their own bodies be between themselves. Now watch this, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So again, the changing of truth. This is why we've got today, oh, truth is relevant. Truth is, truth is whatever truth is to you. You know, I'm, not, I'm just, you know, you're on the front row, so I've got to pick on you. <laughs> You, you could say 2 plus 2 is 5. Oh, that's what I believe. That's what, that's what truth is to me. Well, no, 2 plus 2 is 4. It's always been that, right? But now you've got the world changing the truth. But not just changing truth, but changing the truth of God into a lie. God has God set the boundaries. God set everything. He set the very fact that 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 relationship was between a man and a woman. And by the way, he also said, "Thou shalt have no other gods, and and you shouldn't make idols, and do not the way of the heathen." All these things that God said to Israel, they just rebelled and did. But wait, hang on a second. So do Christians. So do Christians, to the point where Christians today will imagine who Jesus is for them. Oh, I, I, Listen, I remember many, many years ago, I, my mum's with the Lord, she's a blessing, we're, we're, we were all good before she parted, but I remember her saying that when she divorced my dad, which I don't believe in divorce and all that sort of stuff, and I know it happens and whatever, that's the, for another time, but I remember she, she said, oh, I, I want to get remarried again, and she married a guy 20 years her younger, because according to her, Jesus wouldn't want her to be unhappy. So you know what Christians do today? They formulate their own God, or who God, or who Jesus is, up there to make what they do, to make them feel better. Well, Jesus, Jesus wouldn't mind if I went down to the nightclub. Jesus wouldn't mind if I do this. Jesus wouldn't. Oh, really? Hey, let's. Hey, you know what? We ought to. We ought to get a picture of who Jesus is from here. Not, not what people think. Not what the world thinks, but what the Bible says. Do you think Jesus is pleased with things that go on in churches today? I don't think so. I don't think so. Verse 26, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, and a reprobate mind is a, is a, is a mind that's void of the knowledge of God. To do those things which are not convenient. And then he goes on. And look at this last verse. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but they, but sorry, but have pleasure in them that do them. So those who are involved in that are not worthy, uh, not only worthy of death, but those that have pleasure in those that do it. I tell you, our government, our government who is behind this, this month-long celebration or whatever it is and, and everybody that's out there that takes pleasure in everything that's happening today, even God says they're worthy of death. That's pretty serious stuff. Now that's Romans chapter 1 and we're not looking through Romans at the moment but when you think about Rome and Athens and Greece and all that, it's the same, it's the same humanistic mindset that has even crept into the church today. If you don't believe it, go and visit some churches out there. Let's take next Sunday off and go and visit some of the churches out there and you'll see exactly what I mean. That's right. That is right. <laughs> you say, Pastor, you, I, I've been meditating in this all week. I've got to let it out. <laughs> so let's go back to Acts, chapter four, uh, Acts 17. Acts 17.
I love this. I absolutely love it. Verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them, that was uh, Timothy and Silas, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So here's the first thing. Paul was stirred by what he saw. Let me ask you this question this morning. Are you stirred in your spirit by what you see? Or have you turned a spiritual blind eye to it? The very fact that Paul was there and looking at Athens and looking at everything that's around him and probably see all the statues, all the idolatry, all of this sort of stuff. And then to, to, to top it off, he sees this inscription to the unknown God, you know what I mean? And all this stuff, he was stirred in his spirit by what he said. What stirs you this morning? Are you stirred in your spirit when you see our country or your community or whatever it is wholly given to idolatry? Because idolatry can range in a number of different ways. Idolatry is a form of worship. Stirred by what they saw. I mentioned during the week when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Jesus was moved by what he saw. As a matter of fact, go with me, hold your place here, go with me to the book of Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 3, the weeping prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah said this, as he saw what was going on in Jerusalem, as he saw what was taking place around, he was, he was stirred by what he saw. Look at verse number 48. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 48. This is why he's called the weeping prophet. Mine eye runneth down with rivers of water for the destruction of the daughter of my people. Mine eye trickleth down and ceaseth not without, in any, without any intermission till the Lord look down and behold from heaven. Now watch this. Mine eye affecteth my heart because of all the daughters of my city. Mine eye affecteth my heart. What he saw affected his heart. What Paul saw stirred his spirit. Is what we see today, does it stir us? What, what, what should it stir us to do? It ought to stir us to be... Or let me just put it this way. It ought to stir us to continue to be proactive in getting the gospel out there. But more than that, it ought to stir us to the point that if we've got people out there that are a little bit comfortable in all this sort of stuff, we ought to say, hey, hang on a second. Why are you comfortable with all this stuff going on? Hey, I understand that stuff's getting worse and worse, but we're still a voice in the world today. And you and I may not be heard, but that's okay. God hears. God hears whether his church or whether his people are stirred enough to actually say something about what's going on. It's not right what's happening. It's not right. So he was stirred by what he saw. Are you stirred by what you'll see? Secondly, go to verse number 17. He says this, Therefore disputed he. In the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons in the market daily with them that met with him. He disputed with them. Religion, listen, religion doesn't cut it in a religious world. Why was Paul disputing? Paul didn't go to the synagogue this time to open up and read from Isaiah 53. He actually went in there and disputed with people who knew better. The Jews knew better. They were told, you have no other gods before you. They were told, don't make any graven images. They were told all. And so Paul gets up and he disputes with them about this. And I'm, I'm just going to, this is just how I think. And, and it doesn't say it, and that's fine, you take it or leave it. But it sort of pictures, I sort of picture it that Paul gets up and says, how can you guys be so comfortable in this place when there's idolatry filling it? And it's like in our day where you have Christianity today which is so weak and anemic in places like how in the world can modern day Christianity just accept everything that's going on today? 
And the only time that you see anybody saying it is either on TikTok or on Instagram where you get all these snippets of all these guys saying stuff. Where are the independent Baptists? Where are those who believe the Bible? Where are we when it comes gets up to saying, hey, this is not right? Amen. That's right. So he disputed with them. Those who should weren't. Those who had the truth, so to speak, according to the Old Testament, weren't doing anything. They had accepted everything that was going on. Why had the Jew accepted everything that was going on? Because to a degree, Rome looked after them. Because the common enemy from the Romans and the Jews, the common em enemy was the Christian. It was the Christian. And still is. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue. Now notice something here in verse number 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? And others some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to Eropagus, saying, May we know about this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what, things, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear of some new thing. Let me just say this about philosophy. Most of us know the basic philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. You know what's concerning to me? And I tell you, Facebook is an amazing thing, isn't it? I'm seeing more Christians quoting the philosophers like Aristotle, Plato and Socrates than quoting Jesus. That's a problem. When the Christian is so comfortable about quoting these guys, let me tell you, let me tell you what the foundation of the human philosopher is. Hedonism. Do you know what hedonism is? Hedonism is this. The end result is man's pleasure and man's well-being. So you keep reading these philosophers and their end result is, if it feels good, do it. The restraints are off. That was the Babylonians, that was the Medes and Persians, that's Rome, that's Greece, all these people. They all just, the, the, the shackles are off, just do whatever feels good to you. And hey folks, let me tell you, again, it's creeping into the church. It's creeping into the church. Where I tell you, worship is what's being worshipped today. So hey, what do you mean by that? You listen to most Christians today when they leave church and they'll say, man, I, I felt so good. The worship was so good. I just felt so... Listen, it's got nothing to do with how you feel in the worship. Because you're not worshipping a feeling. You're worshipping God. Now, hey, I'm all for having a great time in worship. But it's not about me. It's not about, in a sense, how I feel at the end of it. It's, God, were you pleased with that? When we sang, were you pleased? Were you happy? It's all about you, God, your pleasure. We're here for your pleasure. But when you hear Christians saying, oh, man, I, just, I had such a great time in worship and I just felt so good after that, that's hedonism. Yeah, they're going for a fit. That's, that's humanistic philosophy that's creeping into the church. Now, Socrates. Who's heard of Socrates? Man, I, I was jumping when I, when I was studying this. I was like, wow. Do you know there's, there's uh, post socratal philosophy? You've got Socrates himself, and then you've got, uh, so you've got pre the, the Socrates, and then you've got post socratal philosophy. Post socratal philosophy. I'm going to, the word is just like crazy. Let me, t let me tell you the philosophers that were post Socrates. Cynicism. Cynicism. Who, anyone know any cynics today? Cynicism. Skepticism. Any skeptics? Do you know any? Any Christians who have scepticism? Epicureanism. Stoicism. So Paul was ministering in a post-Socrital philosophy mindset. All of the cynicism, the scepticism, the Epicureanism, the Stoicism. And folks, let me tell you, we're dealing with the same thing. We're dealing with the same thing. 
Because it's creeping into Christianity. Now, I want you to look at verse number 28. Notice he goes to Eripagus, but look at verse 28. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being. Isn't that a great quote? But do you know he's actually borrowing that quote? Do you know where he got that quote from? From, I'm going to mess the name up. Epimendit. <laughs> Epipen, no. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, E-P-I-M-E-N-I-D-E-S. Epimendes or D's. Epimendes. Epimendes. There we go. Epimendes. 600 years before Christ. Sixth century, right? So Epimendes... Here is, here is Epimendes. Epimendes was, a, uh, was a, uh, a native to Crete. Paul told Titus to stay at Crete. As a matter of fact, I'll get to, go with me to the book of Titus. Go, go here. Because I'm trying, to, I'm trying to tell us this morning that the day in which we minister is not worse, if you please, than what poor old Paul or Titus. Were. It's, we're, we're, we're facing the same thing. Notice what he says here in Titus chapter 1 after he tells... Titus to stay in Crete. Uh, look at verse 10. He says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceitful, deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, now watch this, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. One of their own prophets. Do you know who that was? That was Epimendes. Epimendes got, got taken from Crete over to Athens to purify Athens around 600 BC and he made that quote where he said, For in him we live and move and have our being. Because he says, As certain also of your own poets have said. So what's wrong with that? Epimendes, he said this, Epimendes, he, he went to sleep in the cave of Zeus for 57 years. He fell asleep for 57 years, woke up and became a prophet, he said. <coughs> And so he starts prophesying and saying all these things and humanistic philosophy and all this. Sort of, and he was reverenced. I mean, this guy was fantastic according to the, the Greeks and then the Greco-Roman world. And so what Paul is doing is, is in his wisdom, he's saying, hey, listen, even one of your own selves said this. Oh, really? Yeah. And that's why it, when he was at Areopagus, which is where Epimendes stood and proclaimed his great thing to try and purify Athens, that's why Paul said, hey, listen, even your own poet said this and this and this and this. So he was stirred in his spirit. Religion doesn't cut it in a religious world. Hedonism is the foundation of the humanistic philosophy. But folks, let me just say this. The real God desires to be revealed. So the, the bulk of what we read in the Bible reading from verse 22 down to verse number 32 was Paul revealing to them who the real God is. There's only one God, one true and living God. Oh, there's many gods in the world, we get that. But there's only one true and living God, isn't there? So what does he say to them? Well, he, he, he lets them know according to verse 22 that he is the creator. He is the creator. You don't, in other words, he's saying, don't worship the creation, worship the creator. He's the one that created everything. We'll say, okay, pastor, well, how does that affect us? You know, there are times where, we, where we, uh, we worship the blessing more than the blesser. We make much of the things instead of the God who gives the things. And we've got to be very careful with that. That we don't end up worshipping what we receive, but we ought to keep worshipping the one that we receive it from. Because we fall into the similar trap. So Paul says, hey, I'm going to declare him unto you. You've got this inscription to the unknown God. Him I declare unto you. Number one, he is the creator of all things. Secondly, he's not an idol to be worshipped. He's, he's not made of clay or anything like that. Verse 25, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Second, uh, thirdly, he's not racist. Amen. Watch this. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. In other words, God's saying... 
God, God's colour blind. He doesn't see the colour of a skin. We're all of the same blood. And that blood is sinful and everybody needs a, a blood transfusion, i.e. being born again. So it's not like skin colour, this colour. No, it's got nothing to do with that. It's got everything to do with the very fact that God made of one blood all nations of men. Now, did he set the bounds? Yeah, he's got people that live here, people that live there, but we know that according to the map of the world and all those sorts of things. But notice he's determined the time before appointed. Listen, every one of us is appointed a time of death. Unless Jesus comes back. And who's voting for Jesus to come back instead of going by way of death? I'm sure most people would. But he's appointed everybody a time. So it tells us that the God that Paul is declaring to the Athenians is no respecter of persons. Because they had Zeus. They worshipped Zeus or they worshipped Hades. Hades was another one. All these sorts of gods, these demigods that they worshipped, that all pick and choose and had their favourites. Listen, God has no favourites. You're all his favourite. Amen? You're all his favourite. Secondly, uh, whatever, I don't know where I'm up to now. Fifth. He's a God to be sought for. Look at verse 27. That they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. He, you know, to the unknown, oh, we just can't know him. Yeah, you can. You seek after him. Notice, they seek after him. And by the way, let me say this. He's not a Calvinistic God. Hello? He's not a Calvinist. Because Calvinism says you can't seek God uh, God has to choose you. Well, hang on a sec. Let's have a look at this. Just one verse. That they, the people, should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Who's the seeking here? There's people that are seeking him. I tell you, I see it, again, I see it all the time. Christians upholding Calvinism and John MacArthur and all that crowd, reform theology and stuff like that. And I had this thought, and I posted it up on Facebook. I had this thought, if, if God chose certain ones to go to hell, right? That's what they believe. God chooses certain ones to go to hell. But then the Bible says that those who are going to hell are condemned. If you don't know Christ, you're condemned. So I, 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 I started thinking, well, hang on. If God has chosen some to go to hell and then he's place them under condemnation, hasn't he basically condemned his own choosing? I.e. the confusion of Calvinism? Well, how can you do that? How can you, how can you choose a lot of people to go to hell and then, oh, by the way, I'm going to place you under condemnation? It doesn't make sense to me. They're under condemnation because they choose to reject Jesus Christ because of the preaching of the gospel. We go out and preach. They reject, they reject. Then the condemnation is on them. Verse 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like under gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's devices. At the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to remain. He, hey, he's a, he's a serious God. He's serious about this. Now, regardless of what you believe about repent, 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 there's no doubt that some of it is a changing of the mind. You've got to change your mind about this, people. Stop following the false gods and choose the true and living God. Why? Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man who is Jesus, whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead. He's the judge. He's telling them, listen, this, this unknown God, he's your judge. That'll be, if it's for me, tell them I'm nearly finished. <laughs> Talked about Jesus being raised from the dead, verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we'll hear of thee again of this matter. Do you know, God is the God of the resurrection, not reincarnation. Yeah. Athenians all believed in reincarnation going to come back as this and come back as that or whatever if you do good on this life then you'll come back even gooder <laughs> come back even better no he's not the god of reincarnation he is the god of the resurrection and he gave jesus 
for that specific purpose, to die on the cross and rise again so that we could have eternal life. So when you think about this passage, the unknown God, it leaves it open for the world to choose whoever they want to be as their God. But what are you and I going to say about that? What are you going to say to a loved one, a family member, a close friend or whatever who comes to you and says, well, you know, I just, I just believe that God is this and or I just believe that Jesus is this or Jesus is a really good guru. He's a great prophet and all this sort of stuff. And, and I just have my own beliefs. Are you going to just sit there and say, oh, OK. Or are you at least going to try and explain to them? Let me let me introduce you. To the true God. And let's just see if your God matches up with the God of the Bible. We we are, folks, listen, we're living in a day where it requires some serious Christianity. Because if we're not going to step up and say something, is it possible that their blood will be on our hands? If we don't speak out and say, hang on a sec... You're, you're going down a wrong path. You're heading, you're heading straight to hell and, and you need to turn about. You need to come to Christ. Get on the straight and narrow way. Hey, they may not believe you. They may reject you or whatever, but they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. Go on to the next person. Go on to the next one. That's what, that's what we're here for. Amen. So when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, which we didn't look at in the Bible class, when he says what sort, not, well, not what size of church, but what sort of church, what sort of church are we going to be in these last days? Are we, are we serious about the God of the Bible and who he is in regards to what's being out there? Because I tell you, most, most modern Christianity just accepts the stuff that's going on. Well... We're to be a voice. We should have something to say. Amen. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. Lord, I pray that I really didn't, didn't set out to be so serious, but I just, Lord, Lord, got caught up and it's a serious day in which we live. I think it's time for us as believers to not get so caught up in the things of this world, but preach to the world, to share with the world that there is the day of the Lord that is coming. We, we read about it. We're going through it in Revelation. There is some pretty horrific times coming to this earth. And while we're still here, we are a voice. And I pray that as we live in this Athenian world, to, to those who have this unknown God or, or whoever they want God to be, I, I pray that we would have some boldness like they did in the first century and just speak up, not in a hateful way, not in a condemning way, but in a way that would help turn them to the Lord Jesus Christ. So help us, Lord, in this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.